about Ferdinand Marcos. And I wonder whether you feel, in the light of the events of the past months, whether he's abused the hospitality that you offered to him. No, I don't think so. And uh, I, can't, I can't put out of my mind the fact that, and nor should any of us, I think, that uh, his leaving the islands was preceded by his uh, denial of permission to the military in that time of turbulence and street fighting and so forth to take action because the one thing he did not want was bloodshed or civil strife of that kind. And so he left uh, rather than permit that. And so I, it still holds that he's welcome here as long as he wants to stay and can move on if he, if he prefers. Well, is he welcome here if uh, we see that he's continuing to involve himself in the politics back in the Philippines? Well, now, we'd face that if it comes so far. Uh, no evidence has been shown to me that he uh, has done anything of that kind. Well, as I recall, at about the time that you met him in Hawaii and you spoke to him by phone that yeah. very same weekend, he had placed a phone call back to a rally in the uh, Philippines which uh, and said what some people considered to be inflammatory statements, but you don't feel that well, he's... Well, at that time and when I talked to him, he, he feels that, uh, that he was elected president under their constitution. Uh, the election was then certified by the legislature as, as I say, as their law called for. And uh, uh, he was talking in terms of hoping that there could be another, uh, another test of this, another election that would, in which he felt that he would be reestablished then as, uh, as having been elected the well, president. You, you don't believe that in, in view of contributing to the stability of the Philippines that he should uh, absent himself from involvement there or a long distance? Well, as I say, I don't know to what extent I haven't seen evidence to any extent that he's uh, doing anything that has brought forth the little abortive coup that took place the other day. Well, one final question on that. The, the, the statement that was officially issued by the White House yesterday seemed to be critical of him, that, he was, uh, that what he had been doing in the past was inconsistent with the way he should be comporting himself in the country. Well, uh, I think the State know? Department made a, a statement that was uh, uh, more to that effect. and. And as I say, we, ourselves, we don't want to, that was one of the reasons why we were voiced, uh, why we tried to be helpful at the time uh, when he left, was we, we don't want the Philippines to descend into civil strife. Let me switch to uh, developments with uh, the Soviet Union and the arms talks. Uh, in the last few weeks, uh, ever since your Saul II decision, you and other White House officials had been fairly upbeat about uh, what you consider to be the Soviets' attitude, that they were being yeah. more serious and so forth. And yet, there doesn't seem to be any instances where you or officials have cited specifics. Can you, can you share any specifics either from uh, Gorbachev's letter or from some of the specific proposals that we've seen from them recently that uh, gives some basis to this optimism? Well, yes, the very fact that here is the first to my knowledge, the first Russian leader who has actually proposed reducing the number of weapons and who has also voiced the opinion that uh, we, our goal should be the total elimination of nuclear weapons. Well, that's been our goal for years. In fact, uh, I was campaigning on that uh, in 1980 that I supported and would support and hope that we could see the end of nuclear weapons, total elimination. So obviously there's more reason for optimism in this. Now, as to specifics, let me point something out. The mix of weapons and all this such, that you can have an agreement on an ultimate goal, it's like for example, the proposal to cut the weapons by 50%.
But then you can have disagreement on how do you best keep both sides equal while you're arriving at this with regard to the different mix. It isn't as if you're just talking about one specific kind of weapon. And let me point out that when we, in November, proposed an arms plan in response to some of his statements about the overall decrease in, in weapons, it took them till May to come back with their specific answer. Well, now it's May, and uh, now it's only July yet, and we are working uh, very hard on our response to his latest arms proposal. And we're, we're very hopeful that, that we're coming closer to eliminating uh, some of the differences and, and to which we can uh, say it's, it's time now to come together on this. Well, well, you've been making the point about Gorbachev being the first leader to uh, express his desire for some time, even prior to, uh, prior to May when you announced the uh, SALT decision. Is there anything in the last few weeks, in the offers that they reportedly tabled, is there anything in, is there anything that really stood out to you in the letter that you received from, from, from Gorbachev that gives a more concrete basis to this hope rather than a general? Well, yes, in that they are actually talking specific percentages and so forth of, of weapons. And this, this is unusual. This has not taken place before. And, uh, Certainly, we're going to give them the benefit of any doubt that they, they wouldn't be saying these things if they uh, were not expecting us to come back with uh, meeting that as to whether we uh, saw eye to eye w with them on the numbers and so forth. And as I say, we're in the spirit of negotiation. That's what we're doing is framing our answer now. Well, for instance, one of the reported offers would uh in what some people seem to think is a fundamental change would permit research on SDI. Is that one of the things that we find promising, or is there a feeling here that uh, that, that really isn't offering us a great deal? Well, we know that there are probably several years to go in the research that's carried on, and that is within the framework of present-day treaties to conduct that kind of research. They have been doing that uh, for much longer than we have. And we're aware of that. So you don't consider that much of a concession? Um, well, it is a concession to the extent that uh, it is a, a step forward from just their one-time flat declaration that, uh, uh, that we must give up that, that research. Mm -hmm. what, what about the, the, the other proposal that to some people stood out as far as the Soviets' latest offer? was their proposal concerning forward-based systems and forward-based weapons, the bombers and fighters on carriers within range of the Soviet Union, and not counting them. Is that something that, is that, something that you consider an uh, a important departure for them? Well, th yes, but this is, a, this is what I mean about that, that mix of weapons that we all have. Uh, and we have felt, now maybe we'll have to change our mind on this. We had felt for a time that the most destabilizing weapons were the intercontinental ballistic missiles. That this is the one thing that when we say destabilizing, that when people think of nuclear war, they think of a button being pushed and 30 minutes later uh, uh, their world blows up. And so we had thought if the approach could be to try and get at those, at those weapons and arrive at some agreements and then take up the others because they have the other kind too, just as we do. It's true they have placed greater reliance on the ballistic missile and we have placed more of ours on a triad of having uh, the submarine launched, airborne, and the ballistic missile. Uh, one of the reasons why the others are not uh, as destabilizing is we are accustomed in wars, in the recent wars, of uh, weapons carrying, or I mean submarines, ships, airplanes carrying weapons that they can then launch or drop uh, the enemy place. And we know that there are defenses against those craft that 
anti-aircraft can shoot down an airplane, or fighter planes can, interceptors can bring them down, and so forth. Anti-submarine warfare. Um, I am very happy to be able to talk about that for this few seconds here, because for several years now, every once in a while, I am hung out to dry by some critic who still says that the first time I ever talked about that particular subject, some of you in the media misinterpreted and have declared that I claimed that you could call back a bomb or a submarine missile once it had been fired, and never did I ever Well, I think that's an old idea. story. <laughs> but, uh, oh, just recently somebody voiced this in a criticism of the oh. whole thing and talking, and no, it never was. I was saying that the, the same destabilizing fear that people have of the, as I say, push the button and something blows up, uh, does not apply to weapons carried by conventional craft. That's, mm -hmm. in effect, what I was saying. Well, I, I was curious whether in the letter you uh, got from Chairman Gorbachev, whether, whether it was uh, pretty much a formal document outlining, outlining their latest offers, or whether there was anything of a, per of a personal nature that spoke to you. Well, no, all I can say is it was a very extensive letter and went into great detail. And uh, we're, we're treating it in that way. Um, one of the things I was curious about with the timing of the summit, if one happens, is that if it slips into 1987, as there has been some speculation, whether you would still have a, whether you would still be committed to going to Moscow in the same year. Uh, if it timed out that way, I am hoping still that this will that the meeting will be held in '86. That was what we agreed to that an '86 meeting here and uh, an '87 meeting in Moscow. Uh, if there are things that come up that make it impossible to have the uh, meeting earlier than 1987, well then I think that the third meeting uh, for Moscow would uh, sort of have to be based on whatever the time spread was necessary to prepare for a third meeting. How does, uh, how does the second meeting have to differ from the first meeting in terms of, uh, in terms of expectations, in terms of uh, the necessity to arrive at some agreement by that point that's a little bit more concrete in the past? Well, I think, that, first of all, now we know each other. We have met. There have been discussions on these subjects. Remember that in that first meeting, for example, uh, arms control or arms reductions, uh, uh, this was just a subject in which there had been no real communication on details. At least now, we would be sitting down facing each other with quite an experience between us of, of concrete offers and counter offers. Does there have to, to be, on. do you think at the next summit there has to be some concrete arms control agreement? Well, or if you could have one before that, it's all right with me. But uh, I would hope that we could uh, perhaps agree upon something that then from maybe details we would turn over to our negotiators uh, in Geneva that we both have there. One final question on, uh, on, on the subject of the Soviets. Uh, there's some talk that uh, your response to uh, the chairman is already drafted. Is there any way you could uh, give some idea of, uh, of how you're responding to him? No, I, I, you've got to remember this is a part of negotiations and uh, I've never believed in 25 years of labor management I'm negotiations. Uh, I have never believed that you uh, negotiate beforehand in public uh, uh, because that's a part of the business negotiating. It's, to on, deal with the other individual. On turning to South Africa, there, there are a lot of people, including Republicans, who have been saying that we have not done enough to open, open ties with uh, leaders of the black opposition there. And if the Bota government should not be able to hang on, that we would be faced with another hostile state in a strategic location. Do you think that there's any substance to that concern? And if, if so, are we, what are we... Uh, going to do about that. Well, no, it isn't so. And uh, we do feel that, that there's a great need for uh, communication with responsible 
black leaders there and have tried to bring it about. As a matter of fact, uh, both uh, Budalesi, the uh, chief of the, of the Zulus, the largest black group in South Africa, and uh, Bishop Sutu, they've both been here and I've met with them. What about leaders of the ANC? Would you, would you, would uh, you favor open dealings between U.S. diplomats and uh, leaders of the ANC? This is all right with me on the recognition that the ANC, there is no question, uh, has a communist influence. But at the same time, uh, I realize that there must be many of that organization that uh, are not communist. And so it would have to be with the recognition that there is a radical element there that by its own statement and declaration uh, wants only a violent settlement. And uh, as long as they're aware, they know that we're aware of that, uh, yes, we could talk and express ourselves to them about how wrong we think that is. And perhaps the other elements of the ANC uh, don't support such radicalism uh, would uh, take a position themselves. President Bota was pretty blunt when he rejected your appeal to uh, allow public commemoration of the, uh, of the anniversary of so the Soweto riots. What was your reaction to that? He, he, he did not really mince his words when he said well, that they would not accede to that. Well, there's sometimes when you give advice and the advice isn't taken. And uh, from our vantage point, uh, over here, it seemed to us we were in inviting more bloodshed and violence. Or to do that was inviting more bloodshed and violence. Does, uh, does the fact that uh, <coughs> the, tone of his, does the tone of his response support a contention that uh, we're not having the influence there that your administration says we're, we're staying to our policy to continue having? Well, at least we want to stay to our policy so that we can continue contact. Yes, there are going to be times when, and have, are times when uh, there is disagreement. If we've made suggestions that we th thought might be profitable. He's there dealing with the problem, and he has factions behind him on both sides. Support for what he's trying to do, uh, because I believe he honestly is trying to take steps that will bring them closer to the end of apartheid. But he then has political elements in his government that don't want an end to apartheid. And uh, so he's got some tough judgments to make. We know you've ruled out economic, or economic sanctions in dealing with South Africa. Uh, there, there's a lot of speculation about lesser steps. Uh, are, are, are those a distinct possibility if uh, we, we feel that the boat Well, are... we have taken lesser steps. There are certain sanctions. Well, additional. But, uh, the things that are being proposed by too many people, we think, uh, would only be hurtful to the people we're trying to help, that they would cause great economic hardship, not only to the blacks and the black workers in Africa, South Africa, but you have to remember that the frontline states, many of those solidly black governments surrounding them, their economies are actually dependent on the economy of South Africa. And we could wind up doing things that would be very hurtful to these other uh, African states. One last question on South Africa. What do you think the role, when we were talking about black leaders in, in, in the country and the necessity of dealing with them, what do you think the role of Nelson Mandela should be? Well, he's a sort of an enigma right now. He undoubtedly is a, is a leader in ANC. And he was incarcerated because he openly advocated violence. Now there seems to be some word that he has indicated that he, uh, uh, he may be stepping back from that position. So I think it's, uh, I think it'd be worth uh, uh, talking to him. That, uh, well, do you think he should be freed immediately? Well, I don't know that that's a decision for us to make. I would. It, it seems from our point viewpoint over here uh, that this could, uh, if it is true that he uh, is advocating negotiations rather than, uh, than just outright violence, that then this, this could be most helpful. I'd like to ask you a quick, quick question on Gaddafi, who we haven't heard.
from for some while. Do you, uh, do you believe, to use the phrase that Sh Secretary Schultz once used, that all the actions we've taken have put, in, put him back in his box? Well, I don't know, but he's, he, he has stepped back and sort of disappeared from, you might say, public life. And uh, you have to depend on just some observations in trying to get intelligence on that. It also, there is a, an impression that there are, uh, that the government is, is more of a collective now, that, uh, that there are other leaders of prominence surrounding him and uh, having more of a voice in government than they previously had, although there's no evidence that he's been removed from the top spot in government. But uh, there is no question uh, he, he has not been active. What is our, what evidence have you seen about his state of mind? There have been, there's been a lot of speculation about that. Well, I don't think we have anything more than the things that have been visible in his appearances where he, he has seemed to be somewhat changed from mm -hmm. his previous bravado. Uh, how comp what is your feeling about the extent to which this threat seems to have subsided? Is it, uh... Well, we, we can't help but recognize that it has, and that the original uh, fears that there would be an immediate the outbreak of widespread terrorism has not taken place, but at the same time, we don't, uh, we're not going to sit back and get overconfident. Terrorism is still present, terrorism is still there, and uh, must be dealt with. I do think that we made some progress in Tokyo at the Economic Summit, where all of us agreed that we were going to work closer together uh, on this matter. There's, uh, I wanted to turn to, uh, to a domestic, domestic politics for a minute. Um, this year, more than previous years, the, uh, re the religious right is making its presence felt in, in the Republican Party, and there's even a possibility that a television evangelist might be a presidential candidate. Um, as a practiced politician, do you have any fears that uh, other voters who do not share fundamentalist tastes might be turned off by this if uh, if this wing becomes the dominant element of the party? Well, I would, I would hope not, and I, I don't think, I haven't seen any efforts that have been trying to dominate our, our party in any way, but uh, I just have to go back to a time when uh, there were people that felt that there was something wrong with uh, an actor seeking public office. And my answer then and my answer now is that I don't think that any legitimate the trades or professions should be barred from participation in public life. Uh, the, that's the meaning of democracy. You shouldn't judge someone by uh, how they make their living. Well, just as a practical vote-getting matter, though, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't it be a concern that, that mainstream voters, for lack of a better word, who, you know, who, who, for whom religion is not the prime motivation, um, would, be a little, would be uncomfortable uh, with an act, for instance, an act of candidacy if Robertson should win uh, the Republican nomination? Well, let's go back to another time when religion was an issue. Uh, there was a man running for president, nominated by his party. Uh, no member of his religion had ever served as the office of the presidency. And he took his case directly to the other religions and spoke to them in their meetings and their gatherings and opened himself up to their questions and all, and uh, he was elected president. Do you really think that's comparable, um, somebody for whom it just became an issue as opposed to somebody who's... No, but I think it's indicative of the American people and uh, their broad-mindedness when, uh, when they're faced with the problem and suddenly uh, uh, religious prejudice disappeared as an as an issue in that campaign. And I think the same thing uh, true today. But the, I have confidence and trust in the people. They are the ones who will make the decision. Well, speaking of 1988, I was curious as to whether you've ever, you've done much thinking or whether you do much thinking about how you're gonna spend your time. You're two years away from that date. Have you uh, decided what it is you're gonna do with yourself when you're out of this office? Um, <laughs> Uh, oh, 
there are all the usual things, but uh, no, I, I don't think that I'll have any problem of uh, having nothing to do. Well, I mean, do you see yourself uh, in, the model of, in the model of former President Nixon, who has become very active in speaking out on political matters, or, or sort of Eisenhower, who retired and, did, and wasn't heard from all that much? No, but Ike had a, uh, Ike had a, a health problem. The, um, I would think that once having done this, you'd be active to the extent that you can be uh, legitimately helpful. And uh, I think you have an obligation to the things you believe in and to the, the party uh, uh, to not just withdraw and say, I'm not going to lift a finger. I expect uh, I will remain neutral in primaries. I think as titular head of the party, that's required. But uh, uh, I'm going to be very active and do everything I can uh, for candidates that I believe in and causes that I believe in. Uh, as long as I'm able. Well, now I noticed that the First Lady has a contract to write a book. Mm -hmm. I noticed that Mike Deaver is, has a contract to write a book about you and the First Lady and the presidency. Are you going to write a book? There are people talking to me about that. Are you holding, <laughs> right. are you holding out for a big advance? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I haven't even di discussed that. Uh, having done a book once, I know uh, something of what a chore it is. So I can't say that I'm bubbling over with delight at the prospect, but at the same time, uh, I suppose there is a responsibility to seriously consider such a thing as uh, there'll be so many others that are writing about that and always are writing about their view. Uh, maybe uh, it is proper that the uh, person they're writing about uh, has a say. What kind of book were you thinking of? Uh, 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 more of a personal Reminiscing, or, or would it? I, I haven't, I haven't let my mind dwell on that. But you have, you have talked to publishers about that. No, I haven't talked to publishers. No. You've talked to someone. No, no. I mean that people, people who surround me here, other uh, people of that kind, that have uh, thought that it was an obligation for me to write a book and have talked to me about it. Let me uh, turn to. Uh, some some matters of interest in New York. You, when you were in New York on Saturday, you uh, told uh, Andrew O'Rourke, the man who's running against Governor Cuomo, uh, that at least according to him, that you were going to make a point of coming up to campaign for him. Do you yes. think, considering what Governor Cuomo represents, is uh, in your mind a high priority in, in beating him in '88? Maybe excuse me, no. this year. Well, having been a governor myself. Uh, I have very strong feelings about the importance of the governorship. We are a federation of sovereign states. We have been through a half a century or so in which there was prevalent a widespread movement in Washington to try and minimize the states and reduce them to administrative districts of the federal government. I think that that movement has been halted, at least for a while. And uh, no, so I, I, as I say, I feel I feel the State House is a very important part of our democratic process, and uh, well, does the fact yes, that the, I would like to be helpful if I can. Well, does the fact that the resident is Mario Cuomo make uh, any extra difference? Or? Well, I think that in our basically two-party system, there is a difference in the philosophy of, uh, of the two candidates, and uh, I support the philosophy of carried by Mr. O'Rourke, which is one of, as I say, the, uh, the sovereignty of the states, uh, the reduction of government and its impact on the people, its intrusiveness and all. Uh, these are the things I believe in. So I guess I can't make you rise to the bait. <laughs> what? I can't make you rise to the bait of, <laughs> of uh, Governor Cuomo, though his philosophy is a conservative. and. Uh, Last week, Senator D'Amato, who is basically one of your own, said that he too thought that uh, that Madian did not have the highest legal qualifications and that uh, he would hope that you would not press it. Um, does that sort of undercut the argument you made? Uh, uh, well, I'll have to have a talk with him because uh, 
Maybe he's heard some of the things that are being noised around about my nominee. I will never send a name up there that I do not believe is fully qualified for the position. And I will send names up there of people that I believe look upon the judicial process as one of interpreting the law, not writing it, and not trying to impose their social views on the people. We've had too much of that on the part of too many judges over recent years. And uh, I think the attack against uh, Mannion is unfounded. As a matter of fact, it's been based on a number of outright falsehoods. That's all right, Will. And, um, and what um, this, this making something of the fact that the Bar Association uh, only rated him as qualified. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been a couple of presidents in, not in fairly recent years who actually nominated people who were reported as unqualified by that Bar Association. And their judges were, uh, were approved, or their nominations approved. Uh, they say that it was because it was only qualified. Well, in the last two presidents before me, between them, there were a total of 282 judges that were appointed who were rated qualified by the Bar Association. I believe that the attack on Mannion is nothing other than a disagreement with his political philosophy. And one of the most outspoken opponents in the Senate told him that to his face. Now he's seeking to back away from that, but said that he had no quarrel with his qualifications or his character or integrity or anything of that kind. He just disagreed with him politically. Let me wrap up with a uh, pair of questions on Central America. And one is that now that you have won the aid that you wanted to send, yeah to the Contras, and it's not only our prestige behind them, but our money. What happens now if they get um, beaten or defeated by the uh, Sandinistas? What's the, what, what is the next step? Well, uh, that next step would be based on what the follow-up would be, and if the Sandinistas are unchecked, that would be another Cuba. That would be a totalitarian communist state intent on spreading its revolution across other borders to other countries. And I think whoever was in this chair here would have to take appropriate action. And whatever that might be, you can't predict. Mm -hmm. But I, have, I just believe that by giving the freedom fighters the tools they need to become a force, this will provide the leverage that hopefully can bring the Sandinistas to the negotiating table to then discuss the democratization of their country and the goals which they themselves pledged to support in the revolution against Somoza, that they were supportive of the idea of a pluralistic democratic society with freedom of speech and press and all those other things. And there can be no doubt, no question at all, but that the Sandinista government, once in power as the strongest faction of the revolutionaries, threw the other revolutionaries out and created a totalitarian communist government, which totally was contravened the, the promise that they had made uh, during the Somoza Revolution. One last point that I'm curious about. In retrospect, do you think, it, it didn't matter because you won the Contra vote, but in retrospect, do you think that you should have called uh, Tip O'Neill to ask him for that opportunity to go to the House rather than, uh, ra rather than having Chief of Staff do it? No, I think it was pure routine for it to be done that way. And very frankly, I think that it was uh, unprecedented for the response that we got. Other presidents have made the same request and have been uh, granted permission to appear uh, before one House of the Legislature, and uh, several of those were Democrats. Well, thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate your right. having me in today. Well, pleased to be here, or have you here. I'm glad there were no Rose Garden events this week. <laughs> so am I.
fucking band. He'll describe it to you. He wants to do it from here rather than at the desk. What, what, what am I doing? Just here, I'm telling you. Uh, 